All right. Now, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do somewhere. Turn with me to Psalm 126. Turn with me to Psalm 126. We're going to be uh, reading that together. Um, Psalm 126. Um, Psalm 126. <clears throat> so hear, hear the word of the Lord. Um, it says this. Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Um, we ask you this, this morning that you would, um, this psalm would be being lived out in our midst, in the midst of our uh, sowing in tears, in the midst of our weeping, that we would be people who are having our mouths filled with uh, laughter and our tongues with, with shouts of joy, that we would be rejoicing in Zion. So, Father, we ask that this morning you'd be sending us your spirit, that you'd be enabling us as we, uh, these pilgrims in this life, um, would be able to walk in these old paths, that we'd be able to walk in the way to Zion, that we'd be able to walk in the way of joy. So, Father, enable these words to come to life to us, breathe life into us, and show us the way to you. Um, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, if you think about what describes a Christian life, right, what would describe someone who is a Christian, right, what would identify someone as a Christian? Well, okay, well, you ruined it for me, Kiki, okay, <laughs> that was really close to the word I was looking for, I was going to say, she says happy, okay, well, <laughs> often we think of other things, but, but the joy, ha deeper even than happy, but joy. Joy should be one of the characteristics that identifies someone as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian. We are people who are filled with joy. Now, we'll see as we look at this that joy is not just, it's not really at all dependent on your circumstances, right? Joy is not um, the opposite of weeping, right? Joy is not the, uh, uh, it does not require the absence of all problems, right? Joy does, being a Christian and being filled with joy does not now magically protect you <laughs> as if there's a bubble <laughs> from all trials of life. But the, the Christian life is a way of joy, is a way of true joy. And as we walk with Jesus, some, one of the things that should characterize a church, a community that loves the Lord is joy, Think of it this way, the fruit of the Spirit, right? Because some of you guys know the fruit of the Spirit. The second fruit of the Spirit listed is, the, fr uh, the fruit of the Spirit is one fruit, and it's all these words describing what it looks like to be filled with uh, the Spirit. And one of them is, the second one listed is joy. So as we come to know Jesus, as the Spirit fills us, one of the fruit, uh, one of the elements of, the, of this fruit is a life that's filled with deep joy. Right? It's a joyful life. Um, Jesus' first miracle. What was Jesus' first miracle? Turning water into wine. Wine is, I got an amen, right? <laughs> Turning water into wine. And so wait, what is that a symbol of? It's a symbol of joy. Wine gladdens the heart, right? And, and wine in the scriptures is a symbol of rejoicing and joy, right? Um, the, the prophets say in the, in giving the vision of the end times that the mountains will drip with sweet wine, right? It's a symbol of joy and celebration and rejoicing, right? Man, I think I know how to get some amens here, right? <laughs> it is. It's in the Bible. You can look it up. The, the, the mountains will drip with sweet wine. It's a symbol of rejoicing, and celebrating, right? So, so the scriptures teach that Christians, that, that, that God has as an inheritance of joy for his people, right? And this psalm we looked at is a psalm that is one that is filled with joy. So I want us to look at it together, and there's, there's two parts. The first three verses are really about celebrating what God has done, <laughs> 
And the second is looking toward what God will do in the future, a cry of where you are. And, and you will see in that cry that, that the Psalms never deny that there's suffering in life, right? I, um, uh, if you hang around me any little bit of time, you'll hear me say this thousands of times, but almost half the Psalms are lament Psalms, right? So the Bible, the Bible does not uh, sugarcoat our sufferings. It does not try and deny that there is pain in the world, but, but it insists that there is joy, right? It insists that there is joy, Um, So look at the first uh, three verses. It says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Uh, So let's let's look back at the story of Israel. What is the story of the nation of Israel? Right? You have a nation that was uh, in Egypt, slaves for 400 years. Right? And, And God brings them out of Egypt, brings them into the promised land. And while they're in the promised land, they, they're constantly fighting and warring with their enemies. And uh, at one point, uh, the book of Judges, there's a cycle. God is um, delivering Israel's sins. God delivers them into the hands of their enemies. They repent. God raises up a judge. The judge delivers them. Uh, Israel forgets God, and, and the cycle goes round and around, right? Um, and so in the book, uh, afterwards, we see that Israel is sinning, and God exiles the northern kingdom to Assyria. The um, southern kingdom, about 150 years later, is exiled to Babylon. And Israel is weeping and mourning. Their slavery, their exile. But God brings them back, right? Ezra, Nehemiah, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. So God brings them back into their promised land. And, in, and uh, we read that they re- when the temple was rebuilt, the Babylonians burned it to the ground, right? And when the temple's rebuilt, there's weeping of joy, right? Um, there's weeping when God has restored the fortunes of his people. God has restored the fortunes of his people. Um, uh, In in Psalm 137, uh, there's an an old song they they take off this. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion, right? And so there's, there's weeping when we are in Babylon, in exile, weeping because we remember Zion. We remember the dwelling place of God himself where the temple was and mankind is being reconciled to God. We wept. But when God restores the fortunes, we are like what? Those who dreamed. The longing of a heart. Right? A, a, a hope deferred makes, makes the spirit weak, makes the bones weak. Right? Um, and the, but when the, when the uh, longing is restored, we rejoice. We're like those who dream. This is what we've been longing for, the restoration of Zion. Right? The restoration of Zion. Um, we were like those, uh, then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. When, when you receive this blessing, Israel is now receiving back. They're seeing Zion restored. And what's the response? <laughs> it's just like joyful laughing, right? Um, uh, I know some of you have some difficult things that you're going through. Um, but this morning I was hearing from one of the brothers who had one of the things we've been praying for him for, for months. <laughs> got the response, right? <laughs> and got the answer, got, got, got the results, um, got the, the documents that, that he needs. And so what, what is it? Your mouths are filled with laughter or shouts of joy, right? <laughs> There's just a smile that comes to your face and a, yeah, right? When God has restored the fortunes of his people, he's once again placed them in the land. There are shouts of joy, right? And the nations themselves can see God has done great things for them. And the, the psalmist will say, uh, here it says that he, um, they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Then he affirms, the Lord has done great things for us. Right? God has done, we have seen what God has done, and he has done great things for us. Um, I, want, I want us to think, how great are the things that God has done for us? Because this is, we're talking about, I'm talking right now, I've been talking as the psalmist would have seen it when he wrote it, right? Uh, Israel exiled, coming back. But what what do the scriptures say about us, right? Zion, um, this is a helpful thing for us to remember. When we read in the Old Testament and we read about Zion, what is Zion? It's a dwelling place of God, right? Because in the Old Testament, God was reconciling mankind to himself, so he chooses a nation to bless the world, and then he chooses a place, Jerusalem, to place the temple. At the temple, the sacrifices are being made, the nations are being blessed, but, but what happens one day? Jesus dies there, right? 
And Zion is a, is a symbol. Jerusalem is a symbol of the dwelling place of God. It's where God specifically dwells. But the, the New Testament tells us what? It says this. Listen to this amazing word in the book of Hebrews. It says, You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. That's speaking of when Moses is on Sinai and God is appearing to Israel and the people beg, Look, <laughs> you go up and talk. We don't want, we don't, this is scary. We don't want to talk. Um, For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But now hear this. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of of Abel. So we have come to heavenly Zion. We have come to the heavenly Zion. And the scriptures are saying that God has, uh, the, the very dwelling place of God is our destiny in God's full presence. And as we have been reconciled to God, we today can pray and come into the very presence of the living God through the blood of Jesus. So, so let's go back to the psalm, right? How many of us, well, all, how many of us were dead in our trespasses and sins? <laughs> how many of us? All of us, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And God has made us alive, right? So what has God done? He's restored the fortunes of his people, <laughs> Right? He has brought us into his very dwelling place. He has reconciled you to God. <laughs> He has all the sins you've committed, he's forgiven. He's wiped them clean. The distance between us and God, right? The exile, um, it, from the very beginning of the scriptures, when Adam and Eve sinned, what happens? They're kicked out of Eden. A cherubim is put there with a flaming sword, guarding the way. They can't come back into Eden. We're exiles. We're exiled from the presence of God. But what's God done? He's brought us back. He has brought us back. He has drawn us close that we can be in his presence. Brothers and sisters, you now are reconciled to God. You can now come into his presence. Your sins, your past is forgiven. God's spirit lives in you and you're empowered to walk with him. So let me ask you, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Brothers and sisters, God has restored your fortunes. (laughs) He has turned away the curse of sin. He has forgiven your sins. He has canceled the debt. He has wiped away all that you have done. He has empowered you to live a new life. Do do you believe this? (laughs) If we believe this, then we are the ones who have had Zion restored to us. Then what is our mouth is filled with? Laughter. (laughs) And our mouth and our tongue with shouts of joy. Do do we shout with joy and rejoice over what God has done for us? Are we singing? The the image is, we get it. We get it. We have been exiled from his presence and God has brought us near and the natural response is celebration. Right? We celebrate. Um, And we we know how to celebrate, right? Right? We know how to celebrate. We all know how to celebrate. Um, So I'm a huge basketball fan and uh, right before I went to bed last night, I'm checking who won the scores and I'm seeing it's a close game. I'm like, no, no, no. And then, uh, (laughs) and then, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And then, uh, and then we see the the shot that comes in, right? (laughs) The 0-2, right? (laughs) LeBron got it, right? He got the shot and I see the Cleveland, the Cleveland, what happens in Cleveland? You see the video? (laughs) Everyone just starts cheering, right? The hands go up, people start celebrating. We know what happens, right? The crowd knows how, right? If it had been in uh, Lebronto, maybe there would have been weeping, but it was in Cleveland, right? So you see, <laughs> you see the praising of, uh, of like the celebrating, right? What, what, what an athlete has done. People, we know how to respond, right? It's going to get crazy around here. World Cup's coming this summer, right? <laughs> it's going to get crazy, and you will see people know how to celebrate, Right? But so if we know how to celebrate when something good like that happens, we know how to celebrate. Right? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I kind of, right? You make a winning shot, the team celebrates, we jump up and down, 
right? What the scriptures are saying is you were exiled and something amazing has happened. There's now joy, right? Brothers and sisters, are you reacting with joy over what God has done for us, right? Are we celebrating what God has done? Um, The Lord has done great things for them. Um, The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. We are a joyful people because we know what God has done for us. But now look at the the verses that follow because this is really important. The Christian life is, God never promised that we won't suffer, right? God never promised that everything would go perfect, right? It's not like once you become a Christian, you get into a community where there's a bubble, right? (laughs) And there's no sickness, no pain, nothing can ever happen to your stuff, right? The the, the scriptures don't say that, right? Uh, that's That's not what the Bible teaches, but the scriptures teach God is with us in our pains and sufferings. Right? God is with us. In Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the implication is, at times you will be walking through difficult times. Right? At times that will happen. But, what's the prayer here say? Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Right? Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him, right? This is what is, the scriptures promise. And, and, and okay, so brothers and sisters, well, while the scriptures don't promise us that bad things can't happen, <laughs> the response isn't to be a pessimist, right? And to say, oh well, right? Um, que sera, sera. What will be, will be, right? <laughs> you know, that's not really the scriptures response either. We, we, we pray, right? And we ask God because um, we can ask God for relief, right? Um, but we pray, they're praying, restore our fortunes, O Lord. And it's giving this image of, uh, in like streams in the Negev, that the idea in, in Israel, it's not, it's not quite like, like um, this area where there's just green everywhere, right? And so these streams, the rivers would, uh, in the rainier seasons, would fill up again, right? So he's saying, restore us just the way rivers can dry up um, and then be filled again, right? So restore us like these streams that, can, that, that in your time you fill, right? Restore us like them. So it's saying, yeah, God, there's times that you may call us uh, in difficulties. We may be walking through dark times, but restore us, right? Restore us. Um, and, the, and the promise is this then, right? We pray that God would do that, but then the promise is this. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shout, shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Right? Those uh, who sow in tears. Um, if we're not sowing in tears, I, I think we're not really um, attentive to the world around us. Because we have friends and family, right, who are walking apart from the Lord. How many of you know somebody who's just making terrible decisions in their life? Yeah. Right? How many of you know people who are in bondage to sins? How many of you know people who want nothing to do with God? Right? <laughs> Um, Paul says, he, he, he prays uh, with, with tears, right? In Philippians 3, he talks about how he says, even with tears that people live as enemies of Christ, right? I, I, I think sometimes Christians, unfortunately, um, so this way. <laughs> Our culture is going to hell, and I can't believe this. I can't believe the world my children are going to have to grow up in, and oh my, right? And, and, and we're angry, right? Christians, sometimes you hear them talk, like, I, it sounds like you're really angry with people, right? I can't believe that you're going to make my kid live in a world that's like, Okay, God is the judge, and God is not pleased with sin, but what is the actual Christian response? Tears, right? Tears. Because (laughs) we love these people, right? These people are not someone... um, God loved you when you were a sinner. God loved you when you were a sinner, and now we must imitate him and love others. So, yeah, I can't believe this world is going to hell. Yeah, exactly. That's why Jesus came, right? <laughs> That's why Jesus came. So we sow with tears. Why? Because my, my friend is a slave to his sin. He's stuck. He's trapped. And I'm sowing, longing with this weeping because I want them to know Jesus. I want them to be transformed. This is the longing of my heart. And the scriptures say those who sow with tears... 
Um, tears can also come because maybe there's trials and temptations, right? Um, maybe it's difficult. Maybe it's hard work, right? Um, and it's okay. Uh, this is so important. The psalm, this is one of the reasons I'm such a fan of, this, of the psalms, right? Uh, is that it's okay to hurt. It's okay to admit that there is pain, right, in your life. And it's okay to cry of things that hurt. Um, here's, a, here's an interpretive key. Anything that's not going to be in heaven this way, <laughs> right? Um, well, actually, I shouldn't say it that way. Someone will point out, like, marriage isn't in heaven, Pastor Chris. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but then it's fulfilled in some glorious way we don't know how, right? And God has something better, right? Unless there, uh, if there's something evil that God has come to, do, to get rid of, right, it's okay to cry about. It's okay to not feel good about. Let me put it that way, right? If, it's, if there's something that God does not want in heaven because it's wrong, it's okay to feel hurt about. It's okay to feel hurt of the tensions in relationships. It's okay to feel hurt if you're having problems with someone in your family. It's okay to feel hurt if, you know, your boss is just a pain, right? And you're having a hard time. It's okay, right? But there's a Christian response to this stuff. It's okay to cry if you feel lonely. God doesn't want you to be lonely, right? God doesn't want you to be lonely. It's okay to cry about these things. It's okay. And so those who are, as we sow, as we live life faithfully, sowing God's word, walking in obedience, reading his word, the promise is we're sowing in tears because there's, we're living in a fallen world. So, but those who sow in tears, what do they do? Shall reap with shouts of joy. Because when we sow in these tears for the friends we're longing for, we're walking with, God will do his work. And in his time, his work comes. And we rejoice with shouts of joy because people have come back to the Father. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed. So the sower who leaves, the, the image, the psalm sometimes like to repeat uh, an image. You're sowing in tears. So here it's, it's furthering this image. You're going out weeping, bearing the seed, right? Uh, and so you go out to sow in this pain, but you come home one day, what, how? With shouts of joy, bringing the sheaves in with you. God is, gonna, is doing a powerful work. So, psalm 30 says it this way. Weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. This is the grand hope that the Christian has. Joy comes. We are a joyful people, not because of our circumstances. Circumstances come and go, right? Health can come and go. Um, which, which, by the way, um, health will go if you live long enough, right? Outwardly, we are wasting away, the scriptures say. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. If you live long enough, your health, you're going to lose your health. I know we're mostly young church here, um, so you're thinking, yeah, yeah, that's years away, but... Uh, uh, one day, God will restore you perfectly, right? One day, he will. But outwardly, we're wasting away. But joy will come. Joy will come. If we continue walking with the Lord, faithfully reading your word, faithfully praying, faithfully walking with him, faithfully serving, faithfully serving our community, right? As we do these things, as we do them in our tears, joy will come. God will bless your work in your time. As you fight for your sanctification, God will bless it. And in his time, he will be transforming you. As you fight in prayer and action for your friends, sharing the word, God will give you fruit in the time. As a church, as we remain faithful, serving the Lord, worshiping the Lord, praying, in, our, in time, God will give us fruit. And we, will, and we will have joy in the midst of all these things. I want to conclude just reminding us once more um, of what we read in, uh, of, in Hebrews. Um, so this inheritance of joy that God has given to us, it's, it's for now. It is for now. God will give us joy now. He has restored your fortunes. You are reconciled to him. But as long as we live in this world, there's an image the Bible gives. And that's that we're pilgrims. Right? We're pilgrims. Uh, this psalm we read is part of the Song of Ascents. Many people believe um, these 15 psalms were sung by the Jews as they went on their pilgrimages to Israel. It's not proved, but um, that's, that's what many believe. A Song of Ascents is you're sending the hill to Jerusalem. And it's an apt analogy because as Christians, we are pilgrims on our journey to Zion. 
but to the heavenly Zion. And as we go along our way, we are blessed with joy in his presence. And we know that one day we will arrive. (laughs) And when we arrive, it will be all fulfilled. Full joy, full restoration, the full longings of our heart given to us. So while we are on this pilgrim journey, while we're pilgrims in this world, strangers, sojourners, um, we know we go from joy to joy, that God restores our fortunes, but we can't lose sight of that in the end, we get the longings of our heart. The journey is not uh, going to end in failure. Your journey with Christ will not end in failure. Your journey will end in complete joy. Brothers and sisters, uh, let's walk in this joy. Let's be a people that says, the Lord has restored our fortunes. The Lord has restored our fortunes, so our mouths are filled with laughter, our tongues with shouts of praise. Let us be a joyful, rejoicing church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are good, um, that you have restored our fortunes. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, when you, our God, restored our fortunes, we were like those who dream. And Father, you have done immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Uh, You have filled us with inexpressible joy. Um, In Christ, we have access to you. We are your sons and daughters. There's nothing you have not given us. So Father, um, thank you. I ask today that you would fill us with your joy that you would allow us to see what you have done for us, that you would make our mouths filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of praise, that we would break forth into songs about what you have done, how you have restored us, how you have set us free. Um, so, Father, I, I, um, I pray that you would be doing that. And as we are on this pilgrim journey, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Jesus, you know the pains and the struggles in all our hearts. The, the journey can be tough, and there is sorrow, and there is weeping, and we sow in tears. So I pray for us as we sow in tears that you would encourage, encourage us today, encourage us with your love, encourage us knowing that we will reap with shouts of joy. Enable us to see that. Enable us even to see that now, that the shouts of joy around the world saying, we are seeing the harvest because our Lord is reigning. Father, fill this place with songs of praise and shouts of joy. We ask this in your name.